Hi, Kevin. Hey, Elaine. I have to tell you how self-conscious I am actually recording this narration because uh, it's about an episode that I did not make that I'm sharing from somebody I really, really admire about how to track well in the studio. So it's very meta. It's confusing me and it's making me like super nervous. Anyway, I just thought I'd tell you that. Oh, you got this. That's me talking to Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein is my audio engineer, and normally I'm totally fine behind the mic. I'm used to this. I've done it a million times. Yeah, sure, I stumble, I do pickups, but you just redo them. But this time I'm like, oh my gosh, the perfectionism is coming out. And I'll tell you why. Because today I get to share with you an episode that my friend Rob Rosenthal made. It's from his very long-running podcast, Sound School. Let me tell you about it. One of the things about the very best audio storytelling is listening to a dynamic, unique narrator on the mic, weaving a story that hooks me and that reels me in. Like you, I also do have my favorite hosts and reporters, people I will listen to any time. Their voices are familiar to me. They are confidants in that weird way where we feel we know and are even comforted by people we've never met. They're my friends. And... You probably know just how much of a mirage all of this is. If you have spent much time behind a mic yourself, you know that tracking an episode, that is, narrating it, takes time, coaching, practice, a good ear, humility, and a good sense of humor. In the best of situations, it also takes a second person, a good producer or director, to help you do your best. So today, it is my great fortune to share an instructive, hilarious episode of Sound School about this very thing, how we deliver our best performance on the mic. In this episode, Rob Rosenthal goes into the Washington Post studios to witness host Martine Power at work voicing an episode of The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. With her is producer Renny Zvernovsky and they're working very closely together. You'll hear stumbles, rewriting, some crazy vocal exercises, and Rob's incisive questions and narration. You know, it's not often that we get to be flies on the wall of a tracking session. I loved feeling like I was inside that Washington Post studio, spending hours with Martine and Rennie as they worked to get the narration right. Rob Rosenthal is a longtime teacher of documentary storytelling, and he's been interviewing reporters, producers, editors, and artists about the craft of audio storytelling since he began making his show in 2008 under the name House Sound. That's coming up after the break. This is Sound Judgment where we investigate just what it takes to become a beloved storyteller by pulling apart one episode at a time together. I'm Elaine Appleton-Grant. Before I jump in, it's one thing to hear new strategies and another to try them out in community. We're solving that problem with a handful of new, affordable, interactive workshops. Coming up on April 5th, Mastering the Art of the Interview. Interviews are the foundation of all good storytelling, but we don't get much instruction on the art and science of them. I'll give you 10 proven, transformative strategies that you can apply to your own work right away. On April 11th, join us for a workshop on the thing that gives us all headaches, how to curate great guests, and what it takes to be a phenomenal guest yourself. This one's going to be really fun because I'll share with you how NPR producers book guests and how you can set yourself up for success no matter which side of the mic you're on. So check out our current and future workshops at podcastallies.com slash workshops. That's podcastallies.com slash workshops. You don't need to jot that down, though. The link's in our show notes. I can't wait to see you there. There was only music before this. Oh, you already said this. He learned that they were being sent. So then... 
Am I peep-popping right now? Peter Piper picked a pop of pepper. Okay. We're going behind the scenes today into the recording booth at the Washington Post. All right. So this is Steve before you. The Cubans were building a 10,000-foot runway out there, and, and we don't like that. And so we're going to go take it. And we're like, okay, well, that's what rangers do. We'll go take the rare field. Steve experienced firsthand a lot of the missteps that made Urgent Fury a cautionary tale for the military. Hmm. Interesting. What changed? I I was so cautious. I was like, okay. This is a tracking session for the podcast The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. Martine Powers is the narrator. In the background, that's Martine's tracking partner, Rennie Svernovsky. So you're, you're coming off of, like, he's like... Okay, yeah, we'll we'll do it. Like we're game, but you know what's coming next. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So that's a hard line, I think, to walk. But between like his cavalier attitude and like, no, this was actually like poorly planned, poorly done. Yeah, as usual. Yeah. yeah. We'll go take the right field. Steve experienced firsthand a lot of the missteps that made Urgent Fury a cautionary tale. I listened to The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop when it was released late last year. Gobbled it up is probably more accurate. In fact, I was bummed because the shows dropped weekly, and I always wanted to press play on the next episode, but couldn't. Yeah, I don't want, I, maybe Cavalier is a little yeah. too strong, but, but yeah, like that... Um, We'll go take their... The way Steve describes it now is so simple, but you'll hear... One aspect of the series that attracted my ears was Martine, her narration. Martine and Rennie could have approached the narration very formally, given how serious the subject matter is. They also could have taken a kind of this story is crazy approach, because in so many ways, it is a story that's hard to believe. There's the execution of Prime Minister Maurice Bishop in Grenada in 1983, execution by firing squad, that is, And then there's the disappearance of Bishop's body soon afterwards. Those two items alone might be enough for a story. But a few days after the execution, the United States invaded Grenada. So it's one of those stories where you might ask, wait, all this really happened? And they could have played to that. But instead of being matter of fact or at the opposite end of the spectrum, melodramatic, the two of them dialed in a sweet spot. Like in the following clip, the final version of what we've heard them working on here. Martine sounds welcoming, sure-handed, and conversational. How'd they do that? ...was to take control of its new airfield. The Cubans were building a 10,000-foot runway out there, and we don't like that, so we're going to go take it. And we're like, okay, well, that's what rangers do. We'll go take their airfield. When you hear Steve describe it, it sounds so simple. But Steve would end up experiencing firsthand a lot of the missteps that turned Urgent Fury into a cautionary tale for the military. There were failures of For this episode of Sound School from PRX and Transom, Martine and Rennie graciously agreed to tell us and show us how they work as tracking partners so that Martine is at her best. From The Washington Post, I'm Martine Powers, and this is The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. Before I dive in with Martine and Rennie, I should mention for full disclosure that while I didn't work on The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop, last year I very briefly edited for The Post, and I ran a short workshop for the audio staff. Okay, so that's out of the way. Let's listen to the start of the first episode, which is titled Somebody Knows. That way you can hear more of Martine's narration as well as the setup for the series. So I just want to ask to be clear. Sure. Did you ever see the body of Maurice Bishop? No. You're sure? Absolutely. Did you see Maurice Bishop's body? No, I I didn't see his body. Not at the fort? Not at all. Did you see the bodies of anyone else who... I didn't see the bodies of anyone else. Do you remember speaking with any of the people who were involved in looking for Maurice Bishop's remains? None. Over the past two years, I've asked a lot of people some version of this question. What happened to the body of Maurice Bishop and the bodies of the people who died with him? What do you know? No, I have no idea. 
What do people think happened? Well, people, people speculate, people say different things, but the people who were behind it never say, so you will never know. Going around and asking people about human remains is not usually my thing. Some people listening to this podcast might know me from my day job. I host a daily news podcast at The Washington Post, which is to say I don't specialize in crime reporting. I'm certainly not a true crime junkie. I mean, I can't even watch CSI without it giving me bad dreams. But then, a few years back, I learned about this mystery on the Caribbean island of Grenada. Forty years ago, Maurice Bishop, the country's beloved prime minister, was executed, along with seven other people. And to this day, no one can say what happened to their remains. Since I first heard about this mystery, I haven't been able to shake it. So I've been asking questions. At this point, I've interviewed more than 100 people. People who witnessed the killings, people who were convicted of the murders, and others who, for reasons I'll explain later, also have a connection to all this. Soldiers, diplomats, intelligence officers, even a member of the U.S. Congress. Can I ask, like, what do you think happened to the bodies? Like, if you had to guess, where do you think they are? I don't know. I mean, that's I really don't know. I have no idea. I can't even put two and two together on this. And these questions I've been asking have led to some strange conversations. No, the uh, the U.S. Navy uh, is, is not in the body snatching business. I can assure you of that. Still, I've kept asking because the question of these missing remains matters. We'd have liked to have a body to to bury and to respect. You know, so you live with your pain and. Sorrow and what have you, you know. This mystery has been weighing on the family members of these victims for 40 years. It's also left a gaping hole in the psyche of an entire nation. And after two years of asking questions, we've gotten some new answers. Hello? Hi, uh, my name is Martine Powers. I'm calling from the Washington Post. Um, I'm calling because I'm trying to find a forensic pathologist who was in Grenada in 1983. Is that you? Yes, it is. These answers offer new insight into what happened to the bodies and the role that the U.S. government played in shaping this crucial part of Grenada's history. I've been involved in a lot of investigations, forensic investigations and criminal investigations, and I can tell you, in my words, this thing stinks. That extended clip should give you a sense of what I'm talking about when I say Martine makes for an excellent guide. She says to sound like she does, it all starts with the writing. You can read and listen to her thoughts on writing at transom.org. But here, I want to pick up the production process at the point where a script has been edited a few times and Martine is ready to track. First step, mood lighting. The studios here at The Post, they have really bright fluorescent lights, which can be helpful in an interview when you're feeling like... Trying to like bring a certain energy of like I'm here as the Washington Post like scrutinizing this thing and I'm asking the tough questions. Um, but for tracking, we often turn the lights down lower um, and have just like a little lamp on the corner, so it feels like, ooh, like here I am in this kind of like cozy, intimate setting, like talking to just the one person who's the listener. So I find that helps. Sometimes before a recording session, Martine stretches and she makes herself big, like she's trying to scare away a bear. If it's early in the morning, I try to like yell a couple times to just be like, I can sound really loud. This is me sounding super, super loud. And always, she makes sure someone is with her during the recording session. To talk to them and honestly, like, look them in the eye when you're when you're reading tracking, um, I think really helps deliver it in a way that feels like it's, you know, actually hopefully like reaching through the the microphone and, and talking to like each listener as a person. 
That's usually where Rennie comes in. She's a producer at The Post, and she's usually the one Martine is looking in the eye. The way it works is this. It's pretty typical. Martine is in the mic booth, standing up, narrating. As she tracks, she says she moves her face and arms and hands. And if she's reading a list, she uses her fingers to enumerate each point. That helps give her voice the right rhythm. Meanwhile, Rennie is in the recording room, visible through a glass window. She's doing several things at once. Of course, she's recording. But Rennie also marks the time of the best take in the script. That's for the audio engineer so they can find which takes to use with ease when they assemble the episode. On top of that, and perhaps most importantly, Rennie is listening. When you're listening, are you reading the script? Are your eyes closed? Are you looking at a wall? Like, how is it you're listening? Uh, the first time, usually I'm reading the script along with Martine reading it out. Because then I, I know the information that we need to convey. And But I, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll close my eyes, I'll look elsewhere, just to make sure that... I'm not just reading it, and that's the that's the reason that the information's coming across. It's that I'm I'm listening to it, and it's still coming across. What is it you're listening for? Mostly, I feel like I'm listening for not just for whether we are following the script, but whether Martine sounds like herself. Like we spent enough time together that I <laughs> that I know what you sound like, and I know what you sound like when you're excited about something or you've made a new discovery and you want to share it with people. And so I'm listening for that, I guess, like, that that everything you're saying sounds authentic and also sounds natural to say. And if I could add, I also feel like a lot of the feedback that you give that I find so helpful is reminding me how I felt about this six months ago <laughs> or, like, the first time, you know, the like, when I was, when we were writing it or when we were, like, experiencing this moment in the reporting or coming out of this interview that it's just... Um, I think like anyone who has made a creative thing knows that there's this sort of natural arc where at the beginning you're like, oh, this is so awesome. This is a great idea. I'm talking to all these exciting people. I'm getting this great tape. And by the time you're like well through the editing process, you're like, why did I ever bring this upon myself? And I just want it to be over. And um, and I feel like tracking comes in that moment where you're like feeling the the like exhaustion of it but that it's the most important time to like feel the 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 energy that you had at the beginning and so i think many you'll often be like that was a great take but i remember when you first told me about this guy and like remember when you were like it's crazy that this the you know that that he said this line of tape and like i want you to remember that and i want you to like to at this moment really like revel in how exciting this detail is that you're getting to share with people for the first time. And I feel like that's that's what I find so helpful, among many other things. <laughs> okay, 19. Oh, man. Everything Here we go. Let's go. It's going to be this great. Is, this, this is the big one. This is a fascinating story. Yes, it is. It's, yeah. Which could explain some of the damage the remains had sustained which could explain some of the damage that the remains had sustained. Remember Dr. Jordan, the anatomy professor? Remember Dr. Robert Jordan, the anatomy professor? He thought that they looked like they'd been dynamited. That was the word he used, dynamited. Which could explain some of the damage that the remains had sustained. Remember Dr. Jordan, remember Dr. Robert Jordan, the anatomy prof. Hmm which could explain some of the damage that the remains has sustained. Remember, Dr. Rob- Robert Jordan. Oh, my, oh my God. God. You got to do your tongue thing. This could explain some of the damage that the remains has sustained. Remember, Dr. Robert Jordan. I can say Remember, Dr. Robert Jordan. Remember, Dr. Robert Jordan. When I first heard Martine doing this, which can explain thing, I was like, what the hell is she up to? Well, apparently, when Martine struggles saying something, she'll rewrite, of course, but before that, she'll say the narration with her tongue out. It's a way to trick your tongue into enunciating correctly. Remember Dr. Robert Borden. Which could explain some of the damage the remains had sustained. Remember Dr. Robert Jordan, the anatomy professor. He thought that they'd look like they'd been dynamited. That was the word that he used, dynamited. Nice. Do we want one more time? No. (laughs) (laughs) 
This happens a lot at the Post because we um, are often trying to encourage people to get a subscription to the Washington Post. And I find that word very difficult. And so it's often like, for a subscription to the Washington Post, the Washington Post, a subscription to the Washington Post. And then you say, for a subscription to the Washington Post, and it sounds very cl- very, very crisp and clear. I'll do that in like problem spots if I can't, if, if I'm troubleshooting a certain sentence. But um, sometimes I will also just do it at the beginning to kind of remind my mouth how to enunciate things and use all the different parts of my mouth to say the thing. I, that's amazing. I love that. It always works. It does. Like anytime you're having trouble with any phrase at all, after you do the, the tongue sticking out thing, um, you never have trouble with it again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's really effective. Uh, my tough word for what it's worth is judicious. Mm. Ah, I did mm-hmm. it. I have a really hard time with judicious. See? <laughs> judicious. I always want to do that. So the next time. I think, I think you should try it right now. I think you should stick your tongue out and say. <laughs> uh, judicious. Judicious. Uh-huh. Oh, this is, this, this is absurd. <laughs> <laughs> judicious. 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 You're right. We've corroborated his account with more than 10 other rangers that were in Grenada, oral histories from a lieutenant general and a commander who were also there, and three books by a historian and a journalist, by historians, by two historians and a journalist. Sounds like, um, ten, da, 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 nine, da, 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 two historians. Um, this is a serious Christmas carol. We've corroborated we've corroborated his account with more than 10 other rangers who were in Grenada plus oral histories from a lieutenant journal uh, maybe we should also do when we say we've corroborated his account with more than 10 other rangers who were in Grenada that we've interviewed we're yeah, like yeah, with so it's clear that these are like one-on-one conversations that we interviewed also, oral histories from mm-hmm. oral histories and three books. So I heard you guys rewriting a lot uh, during the tracking. It seems very collaborative. What can you tell me about that, Martine? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that um, the script the, the script is just a bunch of random words on a page until you say it out loud. And it's only until you say it out loud that, like, it becomes a real thing. And so I'm saying these three sentences together. Does it sound like three sentences that I would say? No? Okay. Well, then we need to rewrite it. And Rennie's helping you. She's writing as well. She's offering bits and pieces of sentences and words and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, I think, yeah, as you're improvising in the booth and iterating on what's there, I am like a backstop, (laughs) making sure that the same information still comes across. It's just in a way that sounds right. And that leads me back to those multiple takes of just one paragraph of narration that we heard at the top of this episode. Another of Rennie's tasks is playing a quote right before Martine's narration. Hearing tape informs how Martine will talk. I'm doing 10 takes of that line, and every take I'm replaying the, the tape before it again so that I can talk out of it um, because it feels that important. Like, you need to start it new. Like, well, it sounds like you should say that made this victory instead of. Um, yeah. yeah. Can we, how about, can we, this is a small thing, but I think it would help if we put failures in the front. Like, um, failures of intelligence and communication. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe even there, there were, there were, there were yeah. failures of intelligence and communication that made this. Yeah. Failures of communication that made this victory come at a huge cost. When you hear Steve describes it, here uh, let's let's play it one more time. Thanks. You, you get it in your ears. Yeah. There and and we don't like that, and so we're going to go take it. And we're like, okay, well, that's what Rangers do. We'll go take the rare field. When you hear Steve describe it, it sounds so simple, but Steve would end up experiencing firsthand. A moment ago, when Martine says she's doing 10 takes, she was estimating, but she wasn't far off. I counted eight. Regardless, that's a lot of takes for one 30-second segment of narration. In fact, I tallied up the amount of time it took before they were satisfied with that paragraph. 7.18. For 7 minutes and 18 seconds, they repeatedly worked on 30 seconds of narration. 
as you're saying that, I'm like, yep, yeah, that sounds like par for the course. Um, I mean, it's it's so time consuming and everything affects everything else. And it's like you tweak something further down, and you have to come back at, at the top and you want it all to sound. Um, but, it, you know, like like any other craft, if you spend a lot of time with it, I like to think that it, it shows in the final product. Our tracking sessions are really long. I guess my running calculation is like however long the final version of this episode is, we spend six times that amount in tracking. So if it's a one hour episode, we're tracking for at least six hours. How do you keep up your energy, Martine? Um, I know the answer. It's just Sour Patch Kids. Oh, yes. Yeah, so lots, lots of candy. Sour Patch Kids. But then then you have mouth noises. And so it's like we have to take some time to go. Yeah, away. I have a lot of mouth noises, unfortunately, <laughs> that Prenny has heard them all. You've heard mine. Um. <laughs> this is intimacy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. In addition to the candy, when Martine is flagging from rewrite after rewrite and take after take and it's showing up in her voice, she'll take a kind of flying leap vocally at the next bit of narration. I'll talk into it in a way where I'll start really high energy so that when I actually get to the start of the script, then I've come down a little bit, but I'm still higher than where, than where I would be otherwise. Sometimes I'll be like, okay. So, I mean, what's so crazy about this story is that, like, it's it went to all these weird places and there were so many surprises in the reporting process. So it's like that first sentence is going to get cut, but then you're, there's still, like, this lingering tone of it once you get into the actual words that you need. As you heard earlier, there are a few books that we relied on to help corroborate the accounts you heard in this episode. And we also interviewed the authors, all of whom were so helpful in guiding us to more sources. I just want to mention those books here. They are The U.S. Invasion of... <laughs> it's like, yeah. how many fucking phrases are they going to... They are. Okay. You were good. You were so good. As you heard earlier, there are a few books that we relied on to help corroborate the account. What do you guys do when you're done? <laughs> Go home. Martine sometimes gives me a ride home. <laughs> Drive Rennie home at 10 o'clock p.m. <laughs> We've gone to get dinner before um, snacks. We go raid Renita's snack cabinet. <laughs> but oftentimes it's like, ready, we did it. <laughs> we Woo! got through this one. And we'll never have to say these words again. Oh, yeah. I end a lot of them with like, and you're done. And you'll never have to say it again. <laughs> and sometimes that's not true. Thank you so much for listening to The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. And we will see you next week for our final episode, episode six. Thank you so much for listening to The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. And we will see you next week for our final episode, episode six. Nice. <laughs> As I mentioned before, I collected a few of Martine's thoughts on writing for your true voice. You can find them at the post for this episode at transom.org. One of the most popular episodes of Sound School features voice coach Vicki Merrick. It's called Sounding Like Yourself. And the reason I know it was popular is because people have told me on many occasions how they've employed Vicki's tricks, like saying, hey, Vicki. If you're not sure what I mean, well, you just have to listen to find out. It's at Transom. And one more note before I wrap up. I have another episode about tracking on the docket. On the next episode of Sound School, Katz Laszlo from the podcast The Europeans lays out how she writes and tracks, not just for herself as a reporter on a story, but also for the two hosts of The Europeans. In other words, Katz is writing for three people, then tracking with three people. It's a unique situation. That's next time on the show. This is Sound School, the backstory to great audio storytelling from PRX and Transom.org. Genevieve Sponsler and Jay Allison, thanks very much for your help. Thanks also to Jen Jarrett. She's the managing editor at Transom. Jen takes care of the Sound School posts and all the other informative and inspiring articles and newsletters about audio storytelling at the site. Thank you, Jen. I'm Rob Rosenthal. Thank you for listening. That was an episode of Sound School from host and producer Rob Rosenthal. Follow it on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to search his back catalog of more than 300 episodes about all kinds of audio storytelling topics. Rob, thanks for sharing. Don't forget, check out my next two online workshops, Mastering the Art of Storytelling and Success in Guesting, coming in April. 
visit podcastallies.com slash workshops, or check the show notes for the link on your podcast app or at soundjudgmentpodcast.com. Coming next week on Sound Judgment, I go behind the scenes with Todd Henry and Joshua Gott of the podcast Daily Creative. Todd is the author of many books for creatives, including The Accidental Creative, How to Be Brilliant at a Moment's Notice, Daily Creative, which I keep nearby, and The Brave Habit. Todd and I both feel that bravery is one of the most important things we need to cultivate as creatives, but rarely does anyone confront it head on. We will hear. Our conversation is chock full of practical and inspiring advice for creatives of all kinds, and we pull apart their daily creative episode that's about the bravery it took for Todd to kill off 18 years worth of work in his desire to rebrand. Don't miss it. Sound Judgment is sponsored by Podcast Allies, LLC, a podcast production and training company that helps you become a better storyteller in audio and beyond. Thanks to Tina Basir for podcast management, Audrey Nelson for production assistance, and Kevin Klein for audio engineering. Sound Judgment is produced by me, Elaine Appleton-Grant. See you next time. 